Hello and welcome to Series by DFS. This is your DFS preview for the 2021 BMW Championship, where I'll be covering everything you need to know before building your DFS lineups this week. If you want to see what we'll be covering in depth, I have timestamps in the description below. You can also find them on YouTube's progress bar. All you gotta do is hover over it and you'll see them there. Let's not waste any more time. Let's go ahead and get right into this thing. And we'll start here with the tournament fact sheets. I like to start here all the time because it gives you a good idea how the tournament's gonna be set up, gives you course statistics, what type of grass is being used, and the course architect, all great data points to research. So here we are, BMW Championship, Caves Valley Golf Club in Owings Mills, Maryland. First time the tour has played on this golf course, first time we'll ever see it. Um, it's a par 72, 7,500 yards, which is pretty, pardon the pun, but on par for average distance for a par 72 on tour. So it's not looking difficult based off of yardage. Um, I did a course breakdown. What, well, I should say this. I looked at the golf course and did a breakdown. I will provide that course breakdown a little bit later here. But what I saw is a lot of elevation change. Uh, tee shots that go downhill to approach shots that go uphill, which I think is going to provide a little bit of difficulty. But by and large, this course doesn't look too difficult. Um, like I said, it's going to be the first time we're going to ever see this. So we can't really use course history. There's none um, to use. So we're kind of doing this blind. I mean, a lot of it's guesswork. A lot of people think that this is going to be a scoring fest. It kind of looks that way. Um, I watched Kyle Berkshire play this golf course just to get an idea of what it looks like because there really isn't anything on on YouTube or anything like that that's hole by hole. Um, so yeah, what I saw, how he played the golf course, he couldn't play it from the tips on every hole. Um, but it looked gettable. Put it that way, uh, the first person that comes to mind is Bryson. That's why he's on the thumbnail uh, that could take advantage of this golf course. A lot of uh, par fours he can drive. I, should say, I shouldn't say a lot. There's like two or three I think he can he can uh, drive. But anyways, let's go on. Course statistics, 5,200 square feet. That's just a little bit under average if I remember correctly. Maybe it's just right at average though. Uh, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Number of water hazards, seven. Holes where water's in play, five. That's about right. Uh, when I was doing my breakdown, I didn't really see a lot of water, but I, I, I know at least three have actual water in play. I, you know, obviously if you've been here with me in these tournament fact sheets, there are holes where there's water in front of the tee box and that's considered in play. Nobody's hitting that water. So I'm usually a little hesitant to say, oh yeah, absolutely. There are five holes where water is in play, but I think that's pretty close. So I have no, no issues with that. We are on bent grass and it's really interesting this week because I don't even know what pure distinction bent grass is. I've never heard of it before. Uh, obviously, you know, you see bent grass, that's the grass used. And then the pure distinction is the strain of grass. And a lot of these strains are either built in a lab or cross whatever you want to call it or it's mixed in with other things so i don't know what type of bent grass this is i'm just going to use general bent grass stats for my research uh tees we don't really have to care about although again never heard of luminary before i have heard of pen cross uh you have that on the on the fairways again i don't know the specifics when it comes to this i don't think it really matters that much bent grass is normally the same and usually the strains either fight off diseases that pertain to that region um, or one grows faster than the other. That's usually how it goes. Rough, we have uh, tell fescue. I almost want to say tall fescue, but I think it, that's correct. Tell fescue, ryegrass and bluegrass, which um, that type of grass is, is kind of a, a finer type of grass. I would imagine it's easier to hit out of if it's mostly fescue. Ryegrass can get thick when the grass gets long, as does bluegrass. So three inches, that's borderline thick. Um, I'm, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the how much fescue. I have no idea. Looking at this, what the percentages are. 
and if it gets wet then maybe it's going to be a little bit more you know a little bit more difficult so pay attention to weather which we'll obviously cover right after this section but yeah when it comes to grass bent grass those are your greens those are your fairways that's going to be important uh and i don't really think i have or we really probably have no rough grass stats to look at because I, I first of all i don't even know which grass to really go by um it's pretty unique so either way architect we have tom fazio which is an architect on tour for a number of golf courses so those are great data point to start with look at your top fazio golfers and determine where you want to build your lineups there you can see some of these adi other additional notes i'm not going to cover them but you can obviously pause the video read them uh, but we're going to move on. I want to go to a 10-day weather forecast. Obviously, this changes when I covered this for the Northern Trust. Um, it changed a lot. Like Thursday, when I started this, because uh, this is a Monday night. I'm recording this on a Monday night right after the Northern Trust ended. Um, last week, I also did the weather forecast on a Monday night. Guess what? Weather changes. That's that's obviously a given. But the wind uh, forecast even on windfinder.com which i highly suggest you guys use for your showdown slates and stuff like that your especially your prize picks um projections it changed dramatically it went from like seven like somewhere between five to ten miles an hour um to 12 to 18 miles an hour uh, and that was like thursday morning when i looked at the forecast after golfers already went on the golf course so it can change be wary of that i will say this golf course is built kind of in a valley that's obviously it's called caves valley uh that usually protects wind but it also kind of gives you that effect of i mean it's kind of similar to augusta where wind will swirl down in the in the valleys if you want to call it that um but for the most part it's it's pretty protected i would assume well i shouldn't say I imagine it's protected based off of uh, the breakdown that I did and seeing how many holes are down in a valley. Um, usually wind isn't going to hit those holes, especially if you can keep it low. So anyways, that's kind of the, the idea. Uh, looking into this weather forecast is just try to figure out what the, what the wind's going to do. But you can see Thursday, the 26th, 94 uh, degree temps, which... It's going to make the ball go pretty far. Winds are light and variable. I don't know exactly what that means, but you can see the forecast is an average of six miles an hour on Thursday, four miles an hour on Friday, six on Saturday, and five on Sunday. And we have more rain. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm assuming that the tropical storm is also going through Maryland, that it, you know, the, the same one that went through New York. Perhaps not. This might be just a whole different weather system that's coming in under uh, into this area. But either way, wet golf course, usually out of the rough, it's a little bit more difficult in the fairways and on the greens, a little easier, making scoring conditions a little easier. So, you know, it, it's kind of a coin flip. What is the rough going to, how is the rough going to be when it's wet? Um, and if it's, if it's thick, then obviously scoring conditions are going to, change they're going to mitigate a little bit um but if if not it's just going to be a scoring fest and a lot of people like i said think that this will be more of a scoring fest which gets me into the next portion which is looking at past results at this tournament obviously it's not the same golf course um and, and just trying to determine you know what to expect here now a lot of people think or that i've listened to i mean we can look at each of these years if you take out olympia fields which obviously rom won at four under and we look at the winning score all the way across here we're looking somewhere between 20 to 25 under uh 2014 we had a 14 under winner 2013 we had a 16 under winner but everything is north of 20 um which to me how this course looks the the lack of wind uh bent grass is usually a pretty decent scoring grass i'd imagine the scores are going to be low as well so i would forecast something between 
I'm just gonna I'm gonna be a conservative with my um, aggressive forecast, but I'm gonna be like 19 to 22 under. I think that's gonna win this tournament. Uh, and what that just tells all of us: load up on your birdie golfers. Load up on those guys that get scoring streaks. Uh, I think the streakier the golfer, the better. I would I would stay away from you know the grinded out par golfers, those that are really good at staying, you know, avoiding trouble, but just can't really quite convert on birdies. Um, so definitely look at birdie or better. Look at I don't even know if I really care that much about bogey avoidance, honestly. So I think birdie are better. And if you have advanced metrics that can show you like birdie streaks, how frequent a golfer gets a birdie streak, maybe look at, you know, low rounds within the last two months, maybe just even the last month, try to find someone that's really hot right now. Uh, those would probably be good stats to go with. Uh, and even just look at their career. Look at golfers who can go low. Those are golfers that I would most likely want to anchor my lineups around. And I know that might sound weird to some of you guys, like why wouldn't we just do that in any given tournament? But there are tournaments where finding golfers who can make par, it's a little bit more valuable than the streaky golfers who birdie and bogey a lot. Because those birdies become harder to get to uh, during hard golf courses. So it's mostly bogeys that they end up achieving. Uh, and there is a skill to saving par. I don't know if these birdie golfers would have it, but it doesn't matter on this golf course. Just load up on your birdie golfers. Uh, embrace the volatility. There is no cut this week. It is top. I mean, you have 70 golfers. Actually, there could be a cut. It would be top 65. I should look and I should see that. But anyway, I, I would I would research that just to see. I don't think there's been a cut historically at this tournament. Last year would would have had one. So yeah, no, there wouldn't be. There wasn't a cut last year. Um, yeah, there would have been a cut. Yeah. Okay, so no cut. Do not worry about a cut. Load up on that volatility. Get those, those birdie makers um, and go from there. So let's move on to the next portion, which would be the course breakdown. I'm not going to talk about all of the holes. I'm probably not going to talk about... Well, we'll talk about some of them, I guess. What I would suggest, pause the video, read what I have written. Uh, but really what I want to talk about is the summaries that we have here. Off of the tee, I only have two holes where I think it's beneficial to defade. Zero holes to hit a draw. Twelve where it doesn't matter. Uh, and then on approach, it's kind of an even mix. Four draws, four fades, and ten. Uh, ten holes where it doesn't matter. I will also say fairway positioning off the tee will really dictate some of these shot shapes. These are just kind of, you know, if the green is shaped a particular way, it would be beneficial for that shot shape. But of course, if you have the angles that you can work into the hole, you won't really require those type of shot shapes. Uh, we have four par threes. 10 par 4s, 4 par 5s. It's your traditional par 72. Uh, there are some short par 4s. So hole number 1. By the way, they're playing this course in reverse, it looks like, based off of the uh, official scorecard that the PGA Tour Media Center provides. So if I zoom in here, and you can see hole 1 is 365 yards. If you go and look at the scorecard uh, on caves valleys website or um any of the like pro visualizer or course blue golf that kind of stuff you'll see it's an opposite way you'll see hole number one is 460 yards it's a par four and you'll see it goes four four five and then hole 10 would be a par four hole, hole 11 would be a par five but it looks like they have this in reverse order so that's why I'm I'm sure mine looks different than a lot of the other people in the industry because everything I've ever heard from anybody else, well, I shouldn't say anything I've ever heard, of the podcasts that I've already listened to, they have it wrong. So it looks like it's it's going to be flipped, where hole number one's actually hole 10 for the members, um, based off of the scorecard, of course. So number one 
for the PGA Tour, hole number 10 for the members, looks like it could be drivable for like Bryson. Um, it's drivers not needed on that hole, but most of these short par fours dog leg and that dog leg is considered, I mean, the shape of the hole is determining the distance. If you just made a straight line from green to pin, it's like 330 yards, 340, somewhere in there, I think for hole number one. Uh, if we go down here. Hole number five, which would be 14 for the members. Um, this one is definitely gettable. Kyle Berkshire during his little, um, I don't know what you want to call his video, but when he played this golf course, he tried driving it. He was pin high left side of the green, uh, almost drove it out into the woods. One would imagine a long drive competition guy not being able to keep it accurate, but yeah, he was... He was pin high. I imagine Bryson could probably get it on the green on this hole. So there's two holes I've already kind of navigated that he could drive. I also think hole 11 is drivable. It's another kind of, I think it's a sharp uh, dog leg right where water separates the tee box from the green. And it would require a carry, a drive with a carry of like 310 yards. That would probably hit the bunker in front of the green. It'd probably take like 320 yards to actually get it on the green. And we've seen uh, Bryson actually carry it that far. But of course, you need the optimal conditions in order to do that. That that obviously requires no wind in the face uh, or any hurting wind, that is. And probably a day where the ball is going to travel a little bit longer than usual. So there's three holes that I can see Bryson driving and that's it. There's not anymore but i think this could also set up to any of the golfers that can hit a long ball whenever they try to and especially if there is a downwind on any of these holes i think your bombers can reach the green and it would be interesting to see if they try depending on where they are on the leaderboard again this is a no cut so maybe golfers will be ultra aggressive uh on these par fours these shorter par fours so it's gonna make for compelling golf one way or the other from here, I, you would, I would usually go to grass stats, looking at grass stats, but I do not have a DK page right now. As you can see, it's blank. Um, I do have a uh, kind of a modified recent form page, which obviously is, is what I'll go over when we look at optimal lineups. I used to do this way back in the day as well, is, is use this sheet to talk about golf. This way you can see the last seven tournaments or the last seven weeks of tournaments. Uh, this is what this is what's uh, this revolves around my recent form stats. So this is where we're gonna have to uh, do this this portion of the video. That's all I'm trying to get at. Sorry, that was long winded for something very simple to say. Instead of salary, because DraftKings hasn't come out with salaries yet on this Monday night, uh, we're gonna go by FedEx rank, and that's how I have it ranked by golfers here but we really aren't going to use that. Uh, what I will do is we're going to look at last year's stats. We'll look at last week's stats. We'll also look at tournament history and recent form average through the bucket system. So let's go ahead and go there and see which buckets rate out the best for uh, each stat category that I go over. And of course, that's last year, last week, course history, recent form. We don't have salaries, so we can't do that. Um, and I don't think, PGA has the updated stroke gain stats, so we're not going to go over those either. So just the four stats that I taught, I, I just said, we're going to do that in bucket system fashion. So your number one bucket are golfers who top 20 the year before. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Most of your elite golfers continue to come back to the, B, uh, the BMW championship and continue to play well. So we have a minimum of two that have showed up every single year inside the top 10, a max of seven. Uh, so that's what we have here for the top 10 frequencies. Top five frequencies, we do have one. So we've had at least one golfer dating back to 2014 um, that had a top 20 finish the year before finish inside the top five uh, at this tournament. 
So that'll that's number one. That's your number one bucket when it comes to last year stats. The number two bucket, the golfers who did not play. We have a min-max of one and five. And I guess another thing I should mention are always take a look at these numbers here. Average per year and how many golfers are in that bucket this year. We'll bring out uh, strength of field when I have everything updated when it comes to the DraftKings page. That's where that kind of lies within. I don't have those right now, but that will also be considered in here. And that will also drive our projections and our max ownerships or exposures. So your number two bucket, you know, obviously min, min one, max five. 29 golfers in that bucket this year. We have 29 on average. So it's right there on par with what we normally see. Same applies for those that top 20 the year before. Uh, our number three bucket, 20 to 40 range. So golfers finishing in that 20 to 40 range. And again, kind of the interesting thing here is when it comes to minimums and maximums for our top 10 frequencies, we've seen at least one for all three of these buckets, uh, which means I think that's where we need to draw, like grab our golfers from. And we have 16 in the field this year in that bucket when on average we usually see 11 so if we go back to that recent form page and we're looking at the last year stats if i just sort by them you can see all the golfers who top 20. now obviously we have a min of two a max of seven we could grab all six golfers once the salaries come out from this from this range so if you're already trying to eye up some of the golfers here you go i would kind of think about two golfers from this range uh, our number two bucket were those that did not play last year, which we have 29 golfers. Was that correct? Yeah, 29. So a little, uh, that's actually right on average. I was going to say that's a little bit more, but no, it's right on average. Jordan Spieth, which obviously kind of had to melt down last week. Um, Kepka's also in there. That's an interesting choice. Eric Van Royen. Shane Lowry, uh, a, a bunch of interesting names here. Now, I think it's probably going to be easier to select golfers from this range. Uh, it depends on what the salaries are going to be, and it's really going to depend on what the strength of field's going to be for each of these golfers. But I think it's probably easier to select our golfers from here. We're probably going to need some of our 6K golfers. Um, you know what? We probably could go and look at past optimal lineups after this as well. Uh, and I think that's what we'll do. We'll do that after the bucket system just to see how most optimal lineups have been created. But either way, your uh, golfers who didn't play last week, or I mean last year at this tournament, kind of full of, I mean, this is your volatile golfers. I guess Webb Simpson, I wouldn't so much call volatile, uh, but very large question marks on some of these golfers. And maybe not for you guys. Maybe you guys already know who you want to pick your golfers around. But for me, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. I will have to wait and find out uh, all of the stats that come with the DK page uh, before I make my choice. But the 20 to 40 range is the next one. And again, we have more golfers than we typically do in this bucket. It, it's, I think, largely because it includes golfers who, are, who were in 40th place last year. Uh, it doesn't matter, but this group... Has a lot of decent golfers in it. One really interesting guy, Louis Ustazen, who withdrew last week uh, at the Northern Trust. Obviously, he's gonna. I think he needs to play this week in order to make it to the top 30. Because I think a lot of points are given out this week. But I could be wrong. He might not have to. He might not need to. Uh, but yeah, you have Justin Thomas, Xander, Berger. Just those three golfers alone. Uh, I guess Victor Hovland down here. Abe answer. Those are probably your, you know, elite golfers, you know, your B tier, B plus tier and up golfers, but a lot of good kind of lesser golfers like your B team or C team golfers. I'm going to include Daniel Berger there, which might be egregious to some of you guys, but I think he's a pretty decent B team, uh, B tier golfer. I do like Russell Henley. I like Corey Connors. Patrick Reed probably is not going to play. Uh, that's kind of what we heard from his wife, that he has double pneumonia. 
So be wary of that. I know I have him here, but don't play him if he's if he's not going to be in the in the uh, the tournament. Probably just don't play him regardless because double pneumonia is kind of a, a serious deal. So probably stay away from Patrick Reed if he does play. Probably isn't though. So anyways, that is your uh, kind of round out. We can see some of these other golfers here. It's it's, it's interesting. Bryson DeChambeau is a golfer that I think can do well here, but he's not in one of the marquee uh last year buckets let's see what bucket would he be in that'd be the four which has a decent success rate so don't uh don't feel afraid of playing golfers from this range because i mean you have kevin na you have sung jay it would be just these golfers here i mean i think for me it's bryson na or sung jay i don't mind kevin streelman but i i probably don't care that much for max homa or um Harry Higgs at, at this moment. And then this bucket is mostly golfers you probably just want to avoid. Usually this bucket's no good. Um, but it actually has a pretty decent success rate. So, it, I don't know. We'll see again with the DK how it all works out. But let's move on to the next one. I want to go to the last week buckets. Your number one bucket, top 20 finishes. Um, we usually see 20 per year we only have nine this year is that true it can't be true we had a bunch of top 20s last week this might be pulling from the wrong bucket which would be highly embarrassing what the heck i think so so i don't think it's i that we want to be looking at no it's h okay we can make a quick change it's always good to, to see this quickly. Um, yeah, there we go. Better numbers. There it goes. It updates quickly. Uh, 19 in that bucket this year. Average 20, which, so it's right on par. You know, obviously, if you get more than 20, it's because there's a huge tie. But either way, right on par. Minimum of three, max of six. Success rate, 20%. Frequency rate, 100%. That obviously makes sense, right? Um minimum for top five frequencies is a two so really grabbing the golfers who played well last week is uh, a really good place to start building your lineups from number two bucket 20 to 40 range so again just following that same logic grab the golfers who are playing well we have a minimum of one inside the top 10 but we don't have that minimum for top five that only belongs to uh, the last week ones and then again the next one down the road uh, down the line, I should say, is your last week threes, which have a pretty decent success rate, uh, fairly high frequency rate. Obviously, we see a zero there, but 87% is really good. So that's a good bucket. And each, most of these buckets line up with how many golfers we've we've seen in those buckets in the past. So I, I don't think there's really any hesitation to choose golfers from these buckets. What's interesting is uh, your your fourth bucket is the missed cuts or withdraws from last week, but I why I think that's kind of higher is it, it this all goes by frequency. So how often do we see that? And obviously we see the raw total of seven. Now if we want to look at success rate, last week sixes that did not plays last week. Um, a little bit higher. And I think we only have one golfer who did not play and that's Louis Eustace. And so there is some success that comes from not playing the week before, but it's really going to be all on your shoulders, de determining if that's what you want um, to choose your golfers from. But yeah, 25% is not, not awful. Frequency rate's pretty bad though. Over the last, uh, what is this? Eight years that I've done this, that I go over these stats. We've had two years where it has um, produced a top 10. So the I guess when it comes to frequency rate, the stats just don't look that great. But either way, looking at golfers with last week's stats, obviously we want to be pulling from the top 20s and you want somewhere like between one to three golfers probably from this bucket. I think it's pretty easy to get there. You're going to have, you know, your, your number one ranked golfer there two three four five i mean pick your poison it, it's here let me do it a different way let's sort here and then sort here 
Oh, I suppose. Never mind. It's it's always going to do that. Either way, very good golfers from these from this bucket. It's going to be hard to try to pin down. You know, like four. Uh, it might not be that hard. Never mind. I mean, I would probably want no matter what. I'm going to anchor a lot of my lineups around Rom. Um, I mean, he's just the complete package. I do like Sung Jay. I think he's trending in the right direction. Um, uh, you can you can sell me on Patrick Cantley. I think he's a great play this upcoming week. I also think Kevin Na is. Uh, I don't mind JT, and I also don't mind Finau or Cameron Smith. But depending on the price tags, uh, I might be a little bit more reserved on on these golfers. Uh, and the rest of the golfers that are highlighted that I'm not talking about, they're Decent golf. I mean, there's Xander. I, I should have talked about Xander. Don't at me for not saying Xander's name. I, I think Xander's a great player. Uh, and I think it, he's, he's decent to anchor your lineups around. But the rest of the golfers on here, I think, offer enough volatility. By just selecting one of them, you're going to have enough leverage on your lineups to do well. So, yeah, I think that's fine. Your number two bucket is the golfers right underneath them. So this 20 to 40 range. Um which have a lot of golfers in it. Burns, Tringali, Munoz, um, English, DeChambeau, Kepka, a lot of great golfers. And then obviously Taylor Gooch, extremely talented. So is Cameron Davis, Billy Horschel is your bulldog. Like I'll, we could talk about each one of these golfers uh, and why they're good. I don't have an issue with any of them. I'm a little wary of Aaron Wise, but I think, I mean, he changed putters and putting was kind of his bugaboo. He had he has the yips, but I think they're kind of being mitigated by the fact that he's using a long putter. So it, it looks like it helped him last week, 21st place in a very hard tournament. I mean, the strength of field was the best this year outside of the players and two majors, I believe. So um 21st place, pretty good. And and really the rest of the golfers I think are fine as well. And then obviously we talked about the bucket that was right underneath them, which have good golfers in them. So I think this obviously deserves to be the number three bucket. Yeah, never mind. I'm thinking of the number four bucket, which I'll get to. Uh, but yeah, number three bucket, the golfers that finished somewhere between 40 and 60, a lot of good golfers here. Uh, I don't need to talk about all of them. You guys can copy or you guys can pay or Jesus, pause the video and read the names, but you can see a lot of good golfers here. And then what was it? Number three bucket was, or four bucket was the 80 plus and the six was the did not plays. So I think 80 plus, these are golfers who missed the cut. Uh, Morikawa, Kokrak, DJ, I think those are all great plays. Sergio seems like a, a decent play here. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have an issue really with a lot of these golfers. I would probably be a little hesitant on you know like phil mickelson i would not play phil really i i'm not a huge siwoo kim truther uh nor am i really with kevin kisner kevin kisner's best uh grass stats are bermuda we're not on bermuda he won obviously at the Wyndham on bermuda so yeah i i I don't have really an issue with the rest of the golfers but it's really it's obviously entirely up to you guys looking at course history buckets so your number one bucket is that 20 to 40 range uh we have 37 golfers in that bucket this year on average we see 26 number two bucket that one to 20 range so really good golfers 12 in that bucket this year 11 well basically 12 on average those two buckets Great buckets to choose from. They have frequency rates of 100%. We see one bucket that has a minimum of at least one inside the top five frequencies, meaning you want to select golfers from this bucket no matter what. Unfortunately, the course history twos do not have that. But, I mean, yeah, frequency for top 10 finishes pretty good. Your course history three buckets at 40 to 60. Frequency rate of 83%. That's not bad. Honestly, that I think my course history goes back six years, and that's five out of six years that this is uh, this is hit. So that's that's pretty decent. 
13% success rate, 11, usually on, on average, 11 in the field this week. So that's pretty good. And then I don't necessarily care about talking about the other buckets. So let's go ahead and look at our, our course history, guys. So really, it's not course history. It's tournament history. I forgot about that. Our number one range is this 20 to 40 range, which is large and full of great golfers. Hovland, DeChambeau, English, Answer, Morikawa, Sungjae Im. Yeah, it's going to be difficult to choose. Go Finau's in here, Justin Thomas, Jordan Spieth, Kokrak, McElroy. It's going to be difficult to pick golfers out of this one. So I, I, I think we could probably just skip over it just because I think it's a given we're going to see at least two golfers inside the top 10, uh, if not inside the top five. The number two bucket would be the one right underneath there. These are golfers with really good history. Obviously, Scheffler probably only played this once. That's why his 20th place finish last year matches his tournament history. The rest of the golfers, though, uh, I suppose Sebastian Munoz. He would be another golfer that probably just played it once. If you're looking at that kind of game theory where it's like there's no chance they can finish inside the top 10, top 20 again, uh, then obviously exclude those guys. But it's another good bucket. I think I'd probably just Glover, Schwartzel. Those are golfers I don't really care for. The rest of them, though, I think this would be a, a pretty good fit for these golfers. And and maybe not Munoz. Uh, but yeah, Rom, Shoffley, Matsuyama, Neiman, Berger. Obviously, these are your high-quality golfers. And then the number three bucket would be the golfers right underneath the uh, 20 to 40 range. So we're at the 40 to 60 range. You can see, you know, not the greatest golfers to pick from. I like Henley for upside. I don't mind Mitchell or even Lowry. Hoffman, that's kind of an interesting name. I think he might, I don't know if he's going to be a sleeper, but he's playing some decent golf. I, I know he was kind of a favorite of, of some of the guys in the industry. I really didn't know why. We hadn't seen really much of him. He missed the cut, I believe, at the Open Championship. Yeah, he missed cut at the Open. Prior to that, he was at the Travelers. I think uh, that was the other golf tournament that was in the picture for my recent form. And I think he top 20 that, so it looked good. But just looking at all of his stats and, and the fact that he took so much time off, I wasn't sure he was going to, you know, be any good. But, yeah, Hoffman might be a good choice. And then you can see the rest of the golfers. Maybe this is a reason to stay away from Patton Kazire or even Cameron Champ, who honestly, his 65, not only did he shoot it last year, but he shot it the year before. So his, his tournament history might look like he's only played this once, but no, he's played it twice. Hoagie and Gooch, I think they've only played it once, which was last year. Um, so yeah, be mindful of that. And then we have... Van Royen, Burns, Davis, and Cage Lee, who have never played this. And that's okay. That's your fourth bucket. 67% uh, frequency rate. So I think out of the last six years, that means four. We've had four instances or four years where we've seen a top 10. That's not terrible. Um, now, the, the numbers aren't on their side. We only have four in that bucket this year where we've seen 17 on average. So be mindful of that. Temper your expectations. Probably not going to be a good bucket to choose from. But, I mean, the golfers look pretty, pretty good. Looking at recent form, almost follows the, the course history buckets or the tournament history buckets. Pretty, uh, it's very similar. Not exactly. It kind of goes in the opposite direction. But it starts with that 20 to 40 range. 100% uh, frequency rate, 18% success rate. We, we have at least two that finish inside the top 10 every single year. We have at least two that finish inside the top five every single year. So keep that in mind. Your bucket two for recent form, 40 to 60 range. So this is where it kind of goes a little opposite from tournament history, where tournament history, number two bucket went up to the one to 20. This one comes down to the four to 60 or 40 to 60. And we've seen at least one inside the top 10 every single year. 10% uh, success rate, so not the greatest. We have a little less than we do on average this year. Uh, zero inside top five. So I shouldn't say zero inside top five. It just, the minimum is 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 zero where it just doesn't show up every, every single year 
as the Reason Form 1 and 3 bucket does. So Reason Form 3, that 1 to 20 range, these are golfers coming in with really good form. We've seen at least one inside the top 10 every single year, one inside the top 5 every single year at this tournament. Uh, and on average, we see around 5.5. We have 9 this year. So it's probably a good bucket to choose from. And we're only going to talk about these three buckets because um, I really don't care to talk about the other ones. But we'll sort by recent form. Number one bucket was that 20 to 40 range like we just discussed. And it looks like we have a bunch of good golfers here as well. Tringali, Scheffler, Simpson, Casey, Shoffley, Thomas, DeChambeau. Pick your poison. You have Colin Morikawa here as well. This is your number one bucket. It's going to remain your number one bucket because we're probably going to have four golfers from this bucket finish inside the top ten. You just got to choose which one. Uh, number two bucket, obviously, we go the opposite direction from tournament history. So 40 to 60. Uh, and really, I guess who I see that pops out is Dustin Johnson. I don't know if I really care for anybody else. Let's see. Again, Reed might not play. He probably won't play, I should say. I guess we have Jason Kokrak here, which is a good a good golfer who is actually trending in the wrong direction. So maybe we don't care about Kokrak. Yeah, this is actually a, a, a more difficult bucket to choose golfers from. I, I, I personally don't like a lot of these guys. And I suppose we only have a minimum of one from this bucket. We have zero top five. So I'm okay fading some of these golfers. Um, but... Maybe this is kind of where we grab some of them for volatility purposes. The number three bucket are golfers who top who have that uh, top 20 recent form average. So all of their finishing positions over the last seven weeks have been 20 or better. Finishing position of 20 or better. And a lot of good golfers here. I guess one, a couple surprises. Cameron Champ. Maverick McNeely. That's about it. The rest of the rest of the golfers make sense. Um, I really like Rom. Ustazen's going to be an interesting choice. I, I, I don't know what he he withdrew the Northern Trust for. Probably his back, and if that's the case, probably going to stay away from him. Uh, but I do like Kevin Na. Cameron Smith is a fantastic golfer. If you watch the review video for the Northern Trust, um, I. I said a lot of nice things about Cameron Smith. I think he's a pretty much a one of the most all-around golfers on tour. He just doesn't have the elite distance that, say, like a Rom does. But his ball control is amazing. And like Corey Connors and Tony Finau, uh, I don't really have that much terrible things to say about them. If we remove Cameron Champ's win... He does go to the bucket below, and that's still pretty good. So Cameron Champ, keep an eye on him, especially if he's like in the 6K range. I think the 27th place finish probably gets him a little higher, but even if he's in the low 7s, I think he might be a good play. Uh, and, I, and I don't mind grabbing two go golfers from this range, especially if you are taking a higher golfer and then pairing them with maybe... Like, again, I'm interested to see what Cameron Champ's... Um, what his salary is going to be. Also really interesting to see McNeely. I want to see what his uh, salary will be. If any of those golfers are in the 6K range, heavy, heavy considerations. So that is going to round out all of the buckets. Hopefully you guys saw some of the golfers or saw, saw golfers you like that you want to build your lineups around. Again, obviously we went through this. I use this as a guideline. You know, if I see minimums of one or greater, I usually like to start there. So, you know, just as long as the numbers stay around the same, where uh, the number of golfers in that bucket kind of match the average, I can go along and follow the rules here. So grabbing at least one recent form golfer between one to 20, two between 20 to 40, and one between 40 to 60. And that's how I'll build my lineups. That's why I say at the beginning of the video, I'm going to let you know everything you need to know before building your lineups because we cover everything. Uh, unfortunately, we're not covering uh, strokes gain stats here in this video. I'll make sure to do it in my strategy video. That's probably why this one's going to be a little bit shorter. But um, I don't like to go by strict strokes gain stats. They're, they're, 
the short of it, most people in the industry are telling you the wrong thing about strokes and stats. Uh, I'm not saying strokes and stats are bad, but they are analyzing them wrong or incorrectly. And then also telling you guys incorrectly why certain golfers are good based off their strokes gain stats. I do. Th- what I like to uh, look at usually is off the tee stats because off the tee is going to dictate approach. And then from there, I usually like to pair that with putting. Obviously, that's where the strokes gain buckets come into play um, because I want golfers making putts. Now, I get it. Putting is going to be set up by approach. The higher the putting stats, probably the worse the approach numbers. But if strokes gain T to green is in the positive, I think I'd much rather prefer the positive off the tee and the positive putting golfers. Primarily because if you're positive off the tee, you're hitting the ball a long ways or you are very accurate. Those are the only two ways you get positive off the tee. Um... Which obviously, if you hit it further, you're probably just a stronger golfer, and you're gonna have shorter irons into the into the green, which is gonna skew your approach stats. They're gonna make them look worse if you're not hitting it close enough. But if you are hitting it close enough, your approach stats will look good. Your putting stats will look very minimal. They might not look the greatest. So maybe positive off the tee, positive approach, negative putting would be a good one to look at as well. I think I'll 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 look into that this week, but. Tomorrow, um, in the strategy video, we'll go over all the anchor buckets. We'll go over the marquee tee times. We'll do all of the things we typically do. We're cutting this one a little short. Uh, we don't usually. I go over grass stats. We didn't do that. I usually go through my best golfers, which we obviously did. But I also go through uh, salaries. And you know what? I'm going to leave past optimal lineups for tomorrow. I said I would cover it. Uh, in this one, but I'm just going to leave it for tomorrow because obviously we want to strategize around the golfers, around a lot of the salaries that are going to be put out there. And we'll use the bucket system to try to determine, you know, which golfers should we start with? So that's where, that's where we're at. And that's where I'm going to leave this one at. So thank you guys for watching the video. Please leave a like comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the strategy tomorrow. All right. Bye.